Welcome back to our channel. Thank you all so much for the love and support that you've given us. Your ongoing support has helped us make psychology and mental health more accessible to everyone. So thanks again. Now let's continue. Ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle once said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. But how many of us really take the time to reflect on our deepest thoughts, feelings, and experiences to get a good sense of who we are? Nowadays, life moves so fast, it sometimes feels like we don't even have time to breathe, much less take the time for introspection. But getting to know yourself and learning more about who you are as a person can actually do a lot to make you happier, resolve your inner conflicts, improve your relationships with others, and most of all, improve your relationship with yourself. So here are eight of the most important things you should know about yourself. Number one. What makes you happy? One of the most rewarding things you can learn about yourself is what makes you happy, but you might rarely ever take the time to reflect on it. And although asking yourself this can seem like such a loaded question, being honest about what you're most passionate about and who you enjoy spending time with is crucial to finding your purpose in life and nurturing your mental and emotional well-being. Finding your happiness, even if it's just in the little everyday things, can do so much to improve the quality of your life and help you realize what you should and shouldn't prioritize. Number two, your core values. Do you think honesty matters more than sensitivity? What about hard work versus resourcefulness or ambition versus loyalty? Would you prefer others to be more open-minded or more traditional? What about community versus self-interest or freedom versus loyalty? Knowing what ideas virtues or principles you value the most is crucial for not only your understanding more about who you are as a person, but also what you want from your relationships. Your core values are the ideas you want to uphold and they give your life meaning and direction when you need to make a difficult decision or when stuck in times of strife. Number three, how you respond to stress. Are you calm under pressure or panicky and anxious? Do you usually run away from conflict or face it head on. Knowing your go-to stress response is key to succeeding in difficult and demanding situations. Responding to stress in an unhealthy way, like denying all of your problems or procrastinating until the very last minute, holds you back from achieving your goals by trapping you in a dysfunctional pattern of behavior. When you're more aware of how you react in a stressful situation, you're better able to manage your anxiety, avoid the pitfalls of these unhealthy coping mechanisms and stay resilient even amidst emotional distress. Number four, your physical health. When you take care of your body, you make it easier for yourself to manage stress and fight against the symptoms of anxiety, depression, and fatigue. So it's important that you know what illnesses and medical conditions you may have and treat them as soon as possible to avoid further complications. For example, when left untreated, hyperthyroidism can actually lead to developing depression. So the more you know about your physical health, the better off you'll be mentally and emotionally. Number five, your personality type. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? What's your MBTI type? Enneagram type. How do you rank in terms of the big five personality factors? Now, you might not even begin to know how to answer these questions, but taking a personality test is actually one of the easiest and most insightful ways you can get to know yourself better. Knowing your personality type can give you a deeper understanding of all the things that make you who you are and why you are the way that you are. It's a simple, fun, and interesting way to learn new things about yourself. Number six, your strengths. The sooner you learn what you excel at, the sooner you can start honing these skills and realizing your full potential. Are you good at cooking or dancing? Do you have a nice singing voice or a talent for writing? Do you easily finish puzzles and riddles? Or are you more interested in debate and public speaking? Are you a people person, a natural born leader, a gifted athlete? The truth is, until you put yourself out there and give it a try, you'll never know. Number seven, your weaknesses. Just as it's important to know where your strengths lie, it's also important for you to be aware of your own faults, flaws, and limitations. Of course, even though we all know that nobody is perfect, it's not always easy to admit to yourself what your weaknesses are but having some insight into the things you struggle with and why can give you a clearer understanding of all the ways you could be holding yourself back. Are you trying to force yourself to be good at something you don't even enjoy? 
Or are you pursuing a career that doesn't suit your interests and skill sets? Once you know all of your weaknesses, you can either work to overcome them or learn to work around them. Either way, it's a good step to take towards personal growth and self-improvement. And number eight, your ideal self. If there's one thing about yourself, you should always keep in mind, it's who you want to be in the future. Who are the people you look up to and why? What is it about them that you admire? And what is it you see in yourself that you feel is worth nurturing? Getting in the habit of asking yourself things like, what does this choice or action say about me? And is this in line with my best self? Brings you closer to the kind of person you're striving to be. It helps you stay true to your own values, passions, and goals. So, how well do you know yourself? Did this video help you discover what your core values are? Or help you realize what makes you happy? Do you know what your strengths and weaknesses are? Or what kind of personality you have? Discovering self-knowledge can pave the way for self-love, acceptance, self-confidence, and personal growth. Please like and share this video if it helped you, and you think it could help someone else too. The studies and references used are listed in the description below. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notification bell icon for more Psych2Go videos. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hey Psych2Goers, welcome back to our channel. We wanted to let you know that each and every one of your comments, likes, and shares help support this channel and our goal to spread awareness about psychology and mental health. You help us make psychology and mental health more accessible to everyone. So thank you so much for your support. Before we begin, we would also like to remind you that this video is for educational purposes only and is not intended to be used as a diagnosis. So please do not self-diagnose. If you suspect you or someone else might have OCD, we advise you to seek professional help. With that said, let's continue. Obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD is a mental illness that is exhibited by repetitive, unwanted or intrusive thoughts, the obsessions, often followed by an urge to do something repeatedly, the compulsions. It is a very serious mental illness that causes a great deal of suffering to those who have it. But did you know that there can be many different ways in which OCD manifests itself? To help you get a better understanding of OCD, here are four different types of OCD and how they manifest. Number one, intrusive thoughts and ruminations. When someone with OCD suffers from intrusive thoughts, it's not the occasional disturbing thought now and then. It can be normal for people to have an intrusive thought as they go about their day. They may think of something worrisome or unpleasant and brush the thought aside. With OCD, it's a different story. When someone with OCD has intrusive thoughts, they're repetitive and often constant. They can obsess on the thought for minutes or even hours. These thoughts can range in topic and be anything, but some common ones are violent intrusive thoughts, which involve a fear of harming yourself or a loved one, sexual intrusive thoughts, which can involve unwanted thoughts of causing sexual harm to someone or obsessively questioning one's sexuality, and others can involve obsessions on religion and the fear of committing sin, analyzing one's relationship excessively, and magical thinking intrusive thoughts, in which one fears that simply thinking a bad thought can make it more likely to happen. These thoughts are often followed by rituals or compulsions in order to make the bad thing not happen, or to simply assure oneself that they don't feel a certain way about a negative thought. Ruminations in OCD are when one dwells upon a question or theme that is unproductive and likely to lead nowhere. Dwelled upon for an excessive amount of time, more than your average philosopher. These are often different from intrusive thoughts as they can be indulged in rather than resisted. Someone with OCD may excessively ruminate about life after death, visualizing every scenario to the detail, leaving them detached and preoccupied from what is going on around them as they're attending to the thoughts in their mind. Number two, checking. OCD can present itself in the need to check on something. This acts as the compulsion Checking is often enacted out of a fear something bad will happen, such as a fire, a burglary, or harm to loved ones. This can display itself in a variety of ways. Someone may check in with their family members to gain reassurance about their fears, or maybe they feel an unrelenting need to check the door repeatedly to make sure it's locked out of fear of a burglary. Someone with OCD may even try to recall past memories to make sure they felt a certain way or didn't cause someone harm. For example, Someone with OCD may be obsessing on their thoughts questioning their sexuality. 
when they know outside of the obsessing what their sexual preference is. The individual may check or pay attention to their body for arousal, but because they're focused on not wanting this response, the body may automatically generate feelings of arousal. As research has shown, our bodies often react to what is sexually relevant and not always what we desire and value. Or another example, someone with OCD may check an email they've written over and over, analyzing for any imperfections in fear they may have written something wrong or will offend someone. Could you imagine writing an email to your boss only to check it for minutes on end, all due to a fear you may have written something that could come across as inappropriate and therefore lose your job as a result? We all generally need our jobs. So while this fear may seem to derive from an irrational place, those checking their email for the hundredth time are often afraid of losing something important to them. This is a common fear for those suffering from OCD. In the sense that they love or value something so much, they will strongly feel the need to act out these compulsions to protect what they love. And since what you love and value can often change in your life, OCD will grab a hold of what it is you're enjoying and valuing and try to manipulate it inside of your mind according to your fears. This is one of the many dark features of OCD. Number three, contamination or mental contamination. Among those with OCD, there are generally two types of contamination obsessions. One is simply labeled as contamination. Contamination is often characterized by the strong fear of being dirty or contracting germs from objects or people. Someone may not like to shake hands as they have an obsession with contracting a virus from someone else, or someone may be excessively brushing their teeth or scrubbing their hands for minutes on end out of fear of not feeling clean enough or feeling just right. A lot of physical damage can occur due to these compulsions. Mental contamination is an area of OCD researchers are just recently starting to get an understanding of. It can be evoked when someone feels as if they've been treated badly or if someone says an abusive remark to them. The person will engage in compulsions to wash away this bad feeling, such as showering or acting out other compulsions. And number four, symmetry and orderliness. This type of OCD manifests in different ways, such as organizing one's books or DVDs, making sure everything is neat, or clothes folded perfectly and hanging the same way. While a lot of us may simply like symmetry, but those with OCD focused on symmetry and order are obsessed about it and do not gain any enjoyment out of organizing to ensure it feels just right. Remember, what may look organized and clean to someone who doesn't have OCD may feel wrong to someone with OCD because it's about the feeling. Logically, they know their books are neatly stacked and their closet is fairly organized, but they can't shake the strong feeling that it isn't just right. This feeling may even pester them throughout the entire day, which is why they so strongly feel the need to act out the compulsion. With OCD, the compulsion often only provides relief for, often literally, a second. The thoughts and obsessions play on a loop, leaving a repetitive cycle and compulsions are an urge to simply be free of fear and, if for only just a second, to feel right. Fortunately, there is good news and hope in some of this. There are therapists who do understand and specialize in treating OCD. Some of those affected by OCD have seen productive results through cognitive behavioral therapy from a therapist who does understand the condition. If you suspect you or someone else may have OCD, we highly recommend you seek professional help. So, do you now understand OCD a little bit more? Thanks for watching and learning more about mental illness and psychology, Psych2Goers. Did you learn something new about OCD? Are you or someone you know diagnosed with OCD? Feel free to share with us in the comments and engage with others who may suffer from the same type as you. It can help to understand your mental illness more and make you feel less alone in the process because you're not alone, no matter what you're going through. A bit of support could be the first step into feeling just a little bit better if you found this video helpful, don't forget to click the like button and share it with someone who might need it. Subscribe to Psych2Go and hit the notification bell icon for more content like this. And as always, thanks for watching.